10. The Treasure Kajakai, Kandahar Province, Southwest Afghanistan, April 30th to May 10th. Cowards weep and cowards work, but fighters go to paradise. He wasn't weeping now, but he had to work, was too old to fight. Serdar Akbar thought of the poem as he sat, slumped over his drawing table, slide rule in hand, in the tiny room which the administration allowed him. He would have fitted more naturally into a Paris salon or the assembly hall of the United Nations, where he had been Afghanistan's ambassador not so many years before. As Minister of Mines, appointed by the royal government because of his geology and engineering degrees, he had served his country well. As a diplomat, too, he had been an outstanding success. Diplomacy was in his blood. His ancestors had been feudal lords, courtiers, kingmakers even. Akbar had been one of the several hundred young men, fervent patriots, chosen by the king in the 1930s and 40s to go abroad for higher education, for technical and scientific training. It was the king's own idea. They would return, and instead of lording it over vast estates, the technocrats would transform the country, bring it into the 20th century. Afghanistan had enormous natural resources water power, rich virgin land, coal, oil, natural gas, iron, zinc, copper, chromite, even rubies and emeralds. And it was a large country, the size of France, and with such enormous scope that Western experts visiting it babbled about the coming Switzerland of the East, with, for Asia, a tiny population, under 10 million. The New Age Afghan technicians had done extraordinarily well in the 20-odd years before the revolution. Hydroelectric power stations lit carbon and provided the power for the new cotton mills, cascading millions of square metres of cloth. Vast quantities of fresh, dried and canned fruit flowed from Kandahar. Coal was mined, manufactures of all kinds started to pour onto world markets. The traditional industries, the Karakul, Persian lamb, the carpets and skins, were for the first time organised with proper quality control and efficient marketing. Kandahar International Airport, one of the most modern in the world, took shape. Afghanistan seemed set fair for prosperity. But as the country's world role developed, paradoxically the skilled people became fewer and fewer. The demand for administrators and for overseas representation drained the specialists from the factories and the land schemes. The ministries were fully staffed. The diplomatic service sucked in technicians to send abroad as ambassadors. People like Akbar Sharifi went overseas, spent years in embassies shuffling paper, attending cocktail parties, jet-setting around the world to conferences. The country started to slow down. In the meantime, the Russians, beyond their long land and river boundary to the north, had mounted a plan of their own. They wanted Afghan raw materials for their empire, and they wanted Afghanistan itself as a launch pad for their drive to the Middle East, and perhaps to India. The plan was to indoctrinate the young people who were replacing Sharifi's generation, and to distribute them throughout the civil service and the army. Russia watched its red moles, undecided whether to choose a political or a military coup, and prepared for either. When most of the older generation had retired, they were succeeded by youngsters, far less able. Few of them, perhaps three or four dozen, were actually communists, but they were powerful within a weak and inefficient administration. The Western powers, afraid that a strong Afghan army might descend upon the Indian subcontinent as Afghans had done for centuries to establish their own Raj, refused military aid or training facilities. The rulers of the Soviet Union took all the Afghan military cadets they could, 
welcoming them with open arms and indoctrinated them as deeply as they could. Akbar Sharifi retired early, was no longer a possible threat to the Russians, even though he had a seat in Parliament as a senator and was an advisor to the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Now he was demoted, probably lucky to be alive, supervising the installation of the new turbines in the giant white walls of the Kajakai Dam. That December, when the traitor Karmal was brought in as president by the Russian army, many people had been taken out and murdered, even in the public streets. But the Sirdar would never have worked for the Russians merely to save his own life. Brigadier Saki had anticipated that. The Afghan secret police, the KHAD, had been well trained by the Russian KGB in techniques of blackmail. The old man remembered that perfect spring day, April 27, 1978, when the revolution had begun. Certain cadets, trained in Russia under a perfectly normal military aid scheme and completely indoctrinated, had worked their way up in the armed forces for years until they reached the rank of colonel. This was during the rule of Daoud Khan, who had displaced his cousin the king and made himself president. On the day of the coup, there had been only a few communists in the whole country, but the army was trained to obey orders. The Afghan 4th Armoured Division, led by Colonel Aslam Watanja, moved into Kabul and seized the small airfield near the royal palace. While the 4th Armoured Division secured strategic points and government buildings, another communist, Colonel of the Air Force Abdul Qadir, seized a helicopter and flew it to Air Force headquarters at Bagram, 40 miles north of the capital. The MiG fighter bombers at Abdul Qadir's command then scrambled and headed straight for the presidential palace. Their incessant pounding with bombs, machine guns and rockets broke the resistance of the elite presidential guard, who were holding out on the ground against everything that the 4th Armoured could throw at them. Loyal Air Force units, ordered in from Shindand Air Base, 500 miles to the west, arrived over Kabul to crush the revolt, only to find that command communications had been disrupted, and they had no idea where, or what, to strike. Running out of fuel, they returned to Shindand, where they were arrested. Thus the communists won the vital battle for Kabul. Immediately afterwards, Akbar remembered, hundreds of people were murdered, and among the many hostages taken, they included members of the royal family, was his only child, his daughter Nur. He had not been able to contact her since. Thousands of civilians and soldiers were buried in mass graves. In April, the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan, whose birth had been meticulously planned and organized by the Kremlin, was proclaimed. Afghanistan was virtually a part of the Soviet Union. Only the people stood between the government and Russification. Akbar had been left alone at first. Then, three months ago, a civilian captain in the secret police had come to him, just after three o'clock in the morning. Safir Seb, Mr. Ambassador, people in Afghanistan after they retired always retained, by courtesy, the highest title they had held during their careers. Please come with me. You have a meeting with Brigadier Saki. Saki. The butcher, they called him. More recently, too, Bacha i Rus, child of the Russians. Ambassador Sharifi exchanged his pyjamas for a dark three-piece suit. Ghulam Saki looked wide awake at 4 a.m., one of those night people, as the Americans called them, who were most alert while others slept. He sat behind his desk at KHAD headquarters, chain-smoking. He had a close-cropped head and a Mongolian face covered with pockmarks. There was a 9 mm Beretta pistol near his hand. A tiny gun, but at point-blank range like this it could kill instantly. 
The Sirdar hadn't seen Saki for 20 years, since he was president of the Anjumani Ariani Afghani, the AAA, that crazy association whose name stood for the Association of Afghan Aryans, modelled on the German SS. Its members like to use the ancient name for the country, Ariana, and to feel that they lived in the cradle of the Nizhadi Hamuyani, the imperial race. Saki had even lived in Germany. On his Kabul office wall was still to be seen the brown banner of his Hitler Youth unit. The captain withdrew with a smart, Zindabad Inkelab, long live the revolution. Saki was grinning, with a false grimace which only made him look the more malevolent. Come in. How nice to see you. May you never be tired, Ambassador. Have some tea. Are you well? Akbar took the chair which Saki indicated and folded his neat hands on his lap. The brigadier leant forward, one arm on his desk. You will have been waiting to hear from us, respected sir, and therefore this meeting will doubtless be a relief to you. It is often so, as we have found in similar cases and I am happy to be the instrument of your adjustment. A psychopathic killer and a lunatic, that was his reputation, and definitely a fantasist, thought Akbar. He waited. Saki picked up a pencil and weighed it in his hand. From now on, you revert to your proper rank and title of Engineer Akbar. None of this Sirdar business. We don't have princes and the like nowadays, you know. One leader, one teacher of socialist reality, that is the Afghan way. Ha, huh. you nearly said Aryan way, didn't you, thought Akbar. Brigadier Saki tapped the pencil on the desk. Engineer Akbar, a lot of people have died or have gone missing since the revolution. Many of these have been specialists and technicians. We all know that they were killed by the terrorists working for Israel and America or bribed to desert the homeland to impoverish it. That is a well-known capitalist economic weapon. Because of this, I am collecting people with technical knowledge and you are one of them. The Kajakai Dam near Kandahar is, as you know, one of the largest in the world. The Americans botched the job there, or else it was them and the king's regime. We Afghans lost $120 million because of that. Anyway, we need massive electricity generation in that area. You have been chosen to install the new machinery. It is a Sturm effort, a crash program. He used the Russian word, Akbar noticed. The old man spoke. But there aren't any turbines, and anyway, I heard at the ministry that the project failed because the specifications were badly drawn up. You have, in any case, capacity for 120,000 kilowatts, and no industry to use it. Saki smiled. How typical of a blinkered, western-minded lackey. Akbar, have you never heard of the Egyptian high dam at Aswan? The Americans refused to finance it. Western capitalists said that it could never be done. Abdul Nasser asked the brotherly Russians and, Puff! The whole Egyptian desert is green. As for using the electricity, there will soon be an urgent need for all we can make there. We can even export it. Kajakai can be the biggest thing in Asia. Akbar sighed and thought, Export it like the Afghan natural gas, 2,500 million cubic meters, exported to the Soviet Union through a pipeline without metering, so that the Soviets could pay us what they say they have used. Is that the Afghan way? You will have the title of Assistant Chief Engineer. The Chief Engineer is Yildirim Baki, a good party man. Saki emphasized the last four words. Yildir Mbaki is a garage hand from Kartachaha and knew nothing about hydropower up to last week. Akbar could hardly believe what he was hearing. 
He will be an overall charge, Akbar. You supply the technical know-how. So Yildirim was the boss, because he was a party man. Now, Akbar, I want you to work for your country. Build it strong, build it great, to become a fitting member of the socialist camp. The socialist three-ring circus, Akbar thought. Yildirim couldn't even change a spark plug. Maybe that was because he was studying Russian texts. Always use Soviet electricity, what for what is is the purest in the world. Aloud, he said, I am obliged by your offer, but I am now an old man, not up to date in these matters. I would not understand a Russian turbine. Afghan technicians, said Saki, his eyes gleaming with a hideous malevolence, can take a Soviet helicopter, demount the weaponry, find out how it works, and fire it at another aircraft from the ground using string, hammer, and nails as a firing mechanism, and bring the aircraft down. Afghan technicians can do anything, I have observed, if they are bandits and terrorists. Oh yes, I have heard of that, Akbar smiled. He murmured, that's when they are dealing with the brotherly socialist gunships, the best in the world. What did you say, engineer? Nothing directly relevant, brigadier. The new Russian turbines have already been delivered to the site. They are the best in the world. Saki tapped his pencil on the desk again. Brigadier Saki, I feel that, all things considered, I must decline the offer. Then I have to tell you, Citizen Akbar, something more. Hear it and then give your final answer. Your daughter, Noor Sharifi, has been denounced by a patriot for anti-party agitation and is now in protective custody to defend her from the understandable wrath of the toiling people whom she was trying to betray. We expect her confession hourly, of course. I am afraid she will have to go to the correction centre. You may have heard of Tula. Tula? The concentration camp attached to the steel mill, 225 kilometers south of Moscow. Hundreds of Afghan hostages, including women, were working there. Some had already died of ill-treatment or inadequate industrial safety precautions. I am the man who, as a youth, prayed that I might be tested to show my faith, my resolution. Nur is my only surviving child, born in my old age. God damn you, Saki. Damn your Democratic Party of the People. Damn your brotherly Soviet turbines. Akbar took a deep breath, then pleaded as he knew all along he would have to plead. Please don't send Nur to Tula, comrade brigadier. Many of the hostages sent there have died already. Let me have her back. I'll work for you at anything. She is a strong girl, said the Mongolian. If she is assigned to rehabilitative work at Tula, I am sure that she will come out of it refreshed and purged. We need them all, the reformed as well as the enlightened to begin with in the new Afghanistan. You will take up the post? I'll have a travel warrant issued for you later today. You report to this office with no more than 30 kilos of luggage at 8 tomorrow morning. Remember, it's much warmer in the southwest, so you don't need many clothes. That ambassador's suit you're wearing is ridiculous. Take overalls, and you'd better meet the production norms that Comrade Yildirim sets, remember? Just remember Tula Steel Mill, and I'm sure that will help you to solve all problems. Good day, Comrade Engineer Akbar. Long live the revolution. Brigadier Saki was dead now, gunned down by a patriot outside the Soviet embassy in Kabul on April the 18th. But that hadn't helped Noor, and Sirdar Akbar was still a captive at the hydropower dam. Akbar looked at his slide rule once more and did the calculations all over again. They came out the same as at all the other times. It wasn't the specifications, 
but there was something wrong somewhere. The massive steel-reinforced concrete at Kajakai was sound, and the dam, standing there since the 1950s, was as firm as a rock. The immense bulk of the dam sat partly within a hollow, blasted from the rocks like some enormous giant's tooth filling, gleaming white out of the grey. Good enough. When the mass of the matrix, the rock, had been calculated, it was obvious, given the character of the rock itself, that the dam would hold. Now, however, on a tour of inspection of the encircling mountain girdle, Akbar had found that some rocks were fissured. Earthquakes? No, that had been taken into account. Erosion? Next to no rainfall here, and there had not been time for any significant erosion to take place. Blasting? It could never have produced such effects. Only one possibility occurred to him, a remote one. If the rock were partly of a different consistency from the samples on which the original calculations of their stress resistance had been based, could the dam burst? Was the $120 million really wasted? Akbar got up and called his servant. He'd brought the brothers Salik and Samir with him from Kabul. They were the only two people in the world now who cared about him and could help in any way. Samir, call the guard. Say I have to inspect the rock face again. He can bring the jeep and will leave as soon as it comes round to the front. By my eyes, Excellency. He was back in three minutes. I've told the gendarme. The internal telephone rang. Engineer Akbar, Chief Engineer Yildirim here. Go and look at the rock face if you must, but you can't have the jeep. The driver is busy. Yildirim had sent him off to fetch drink or hashish or something. That would be it. But there's no problem, engineer. Just take Samir. How about an escort? I'm not allowed out on my own. That's quite in order. Just put Samir on the line. I'll tell him something. Samir, too. Samir as his escort. Gone over to Yildirim, to the Russian side? Samir took the handset. Bali, Bali, yes, yes, I understand. Yes, by my eyes. He didn't look at his master as he replaced the instrument on its cradle. Why am I allowed out alone with only you, Samir Khan? Better have it out with him now. Excellency, we are allowed out, or rather you are, because I am to be responsible for your safe return after the inspection. And if I tried to escape, would you stop me? Yildirim is holding Salik, Excellency, against our return. Would you have him kill my brother? May the right prevail. May the evildoers receive their recompense, whoever they are, Samir. Let's go. On foot. Yildirim was almost certainly corrupt. Greedy, too. But he was still afraid enough of Kabul, of the KGB, to keep a tight grip on affairs at Kajakai. But if Yildirim had such strict orders, this suggested a possibility. That Saki had no real hold on Akbar, that Nur was perhaps free. He could never act on any such flimsy hypothesis, but the thought was a kind of hope, one to keep at the back of his mind where there was none like a false coin in an otherwise empty purse. They tramped around all morning. Akbar looked at the rock. No, there were no inherent weaknesses. It was all of the same type. Now for the fissures. He found one and clambered down, leaving Samir at the top of a rise. He was in a dry riverbed. There was the base of the crack. Measure the length and width of the gap, do some calculations, after estimating the weight of rock, the stress factors. Here was a boulder, wedged in the fissure. It must have been there some time, for there was moss on it. He looked again, just like a doorway in a sense. He felt words going round in his head. The heat must be affecting him. No, it wasn't the heat. 
he was reciting the words of the old tale. And lo, Allah Adin called out, Open sesame! And slowly the boulder swung aside, and the young man entered the cavern of treasures. He tugged at the boulder. It came away easily, just as if on a pivot. The fissure led to a passage, then a cave. Akbar walked inside. This was a honeycomb, a catacomb, in fact, part of the very ancient underground dwelling places, cities almost, which were found all over Afghanistan, and all the way to the Gobi in Mongolia. Generations of troglodytes had lived here millennia ago. That was it. The dam's weight had cracked the rock because it wasn't a solid matrix at all, not at this point at least. It was a mass of passages, linked caves, leading to caverns. Sometimes there were even underground saline lakes in places like this. He would have to make more calculations. As the days passed, Akbar supervised the unloading of the generator turbines from their immense transporters and had them positioned near the gullies which would eventually receive them. There was a great deal to do, even moving such weights was a major feat of engineering in itself. The American-built town of Lashkagar, near Kajakai, had been virtually deserted for years, but was now suddenly full of workers. Party officials, nomads and traders. A large space was turned into a market, a mayor and police chief were appointed, a court sat once a week, and even the present generator capacity of the installation was becoming stretched, as demands for power continually increased, for light, for machines, and to supply current for the cookers, videos, food mixers and deep freezes. Wherever did all these people, all this equipment, come from? The place was like a boom town. What an extraordinary transformation. And Argandab, 60 miles to the southeast, lay the second of the monster dams, again American-built, with its own town and hydropower centre. This dam, with its huge lake, hardly 20 miles from that other white elephant, Kandahar International Airport, was also about to burst into life. One day, visiting the engineering shops there to get some spare parts, Akbar saw crowds of Russian technicians, Soviet Air Force officers, and the piles of aeronautical maintenance equipment being offloaded from huge trucks. Walls were plastered with posters showing an Afghan soldier side by side with a peasant, busily defending the revolution with a gun. People had even unearthed some ancient posters from the American period and stuck them up, perhaps in an excess of zeal. They showed an Afghan in a peaked cap and an American engineer in a turban, both admiring a huge melon. They stood beside a Ford tractor, shaking hands. Underneath was the triumphant caption, Water for the Thirsty Land. Another rousing slogan, though, had been partly covered in whitewash. Running the length of a long, low building, it proclaimed, in English, Afghanistan, with its proud and ancient peoples, welcomes the new ways of U.S. technology. But at Argandab, the usual miserable presence of Afghan army conscripts was not to be seen. Here, instead, were fresh-faced, well-fed, stalwart troops, well turned out, looking properly defiant. A lot of money and training had been deployed, Akbar could see, to effect this transformation. They goose-stepped around the new monument to the fallen heroes, too, in a very Russian fashion. The guard, like the one at Lenin's tomb in Red Square, was changed every hour on the hour. Their vehicles bore the blazon of the Afghan 15th Infantry Division. Back to Kajakai. Akbar, in a series of forays, had mapped many of the galleries inside the mountain walls around his dam. The cracks, he was now positive, had reached their maximum extension and were not going to expand further. Nothing was going to disturb the ancient monastery for some time yet. But as he worked on the survey of the place, something nagged his memory, something from the distant past. 
He knew it was related somehow to the area north of Kandahar. He could not quite capture it. Old age, he supposed, was having its traditional effect. He used to know it, that was sure. Perhaps he'd forget his own name next. Then one day, exploring the caves, he stumbled on the Great Tunnel. This, his engineer's eye told him, was of relatively recent date, and the discovery of a bolster chisel and a nearly modern-looking hammer confirmed this assessment, about a hundred years old. Akbar remembered now about the story. It said that the Afghan ruler, Amir Abdur Rahman, at the time of Queen Victoria, had had prisoners working somewhere up here, feverishly and for years, to seek some hidden treasure. Yes, that was it, the loot of Ahmad Shah, talked about with bated breath as the greatest treasure the world had ever known. But they hadn't found it. Still, this was a promising place, near enough to where Ahmad Shah, Afghanistan's first king, was said to have diverted the river and discovered an underground tunnel complex. The master tunnel, as he named it on his sketch maps, was large, dry as a bone, and free of moss and fungus. Why had the tunnel been cut at all? Looking at the plan, Akbar projected the line of the passage at its present angle to the surface. It should emerge there. The next day he was climbing with Samir to the vantage point, the outcrop of rock above and to the north of the dam, officially to continue his inspection. The view from this point was breathtaking. They could see over thousands of acres, both new farmland and desert, to the forests beyond. On the surface of the dam, a vast expanse of still water, tens of thousands of waterbirds of every Afghan variety went about their business, unconcerned about being in a country at war. And here, just a few yards away, what he had thought was an ancient fort was revealed as the ruins of a medieval mosque. He and Samir spent hours clearing rubble with their bare hands, moving carved marble pillars, stacking exquisite blue tiles, looking for the entrance to the tunnel. It was there, all right just behind the prayer niche facing Mecca, as Samir pushed away a pile of rubble from the collapsed roof, a dark hole with steps came into view. The two men, without exchanging a word, began to climb downwards. Samir, who had few possessions, was proud of his flashlight, which he kept clipped, as a schoolboy might, to his belt. Now it stood them in good stead, the steps were easy to use, the treads were intact, and whoever had made them had taken care that the rises were no higher than even an old man could comfortably manage. Akbar, however, panting with the excitement of the unknown, was relieved that they were going down and not up. At the bottom of the steps, a tunnel ran into another passage at right angles to it. Then it opened out into a vast passageway with man-made caves to left and right. Akbar went into the first cave, knocking over a slab of clay, which toppled from a perished wooden plinth as he brushed past. It was here, almost as an anticlimax after such suspense, that Sirdar Akbar and Samir found the gold. At first they thought that they were looking at a wall, with leaves of long-dead creepers hanging down, one over another, covering the three sides of the cavern from floor to roof. But as soon as Akbar touched this surface, he realized that the scraps were tattered pieces of ancient, perished leather, remnants of the once sturdy sacks in which the gold coins, millions of mohurs, had been stored. Samir stood stock still playing his light back and forth like an automaton as the coins came cascading to the ground, bright as the day they were minted. There was no damp to corrode metal, Akbar realized, and fine gold does not oxidize anyway. The Horde of Ahmad Shah 
As Sirdar Akbar stood there, senses reeling, Samir stepped forward and pulled at another piece of leather. More coins spilled out, tinkling, then lay like a frozen stream, silent, shining, challenging. Akbar took the flashlight from Samir's hand and went back into the passage. Immediately opposite the cave which they had just left was another, full of sacks. Walking down the tunnel, the two men counted twenty such caves, until they turned and retraced their steps. When they reached the first cave, Akbar picked up the clay tablet and slipped it into his satchel. It had writing of some sort on it. Samir, we must get back to the administration offices in case they miss us. He did not caution Samir not to tell anyone of their find, and Samir knew that, after this, neither would speak of it to anybody, at least until they had absorbed the staggering facts. Ah, yes, Excellency. As they climbed the steps to the ruined mosque, Samir said, There must be a million coins there, Excellency. Yes, Samir, millions. They were late back at the offices, but Yildirim, which means thunderbolt in Turki, didn't care. Busily justifying his name, he was jumping about in a drunken frenzy, playfully striking with a stick at some Russian troopers who had drunk orange juice mixed with a can of antifreeze liquid, intended for their tanks. Holding Salik as hostage, engineer Yildirim had dismissed the old man and Samir from his mind. When they got to Akbar's room without challenge, passing the sounds of revelry coming from the party in the canteen, the two men slumped into armchairs. Samir had never so much as sat down in his master's presence, let alone sprawled in his best seat, but neither noticed. Then, like schoolboys suddenly given a whole day off, they jumped to their feet and danced, twisting and whirling, in the ecstatic if undignified configurations of the Atari, the national sword dance. Then they stopped, giggling, slapping one another on the back, shaking their heads in near disbelief. Finally, with Akbar shouting, Must ye be my, drunken without wine, they sat down again. Sirdar Akbar remembered the tablet and brought it out from his bag. It was small, no larger than an average modern book, and the words on it were impressed, scratched as if with a piece of wood, in excellent Persian calligraphy. He wiped it with his bandana handkerchief and placed it on the desk under his reading lamp. The words stood out clearly. 786 this was the numerical equivalent of the phrase, in the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful, often used in manuscripts and inscriptions. Then, Kazana itila izat ishahana, Sultan Ahmad Shah, dur i duran. Gold treasury of the essence of royalty, Sultan Ahmad Shah, pearl of pearls. Then the date, 1171 Hijri. Year of the Flight, equivalent in the Christian era to 1757, the year after Ahmad Shah had sacked Delhi and carried away the treasures of the great moguls. Samir, looking over Akbar's shoulder, could not make out the words. Literacy was not his strong point. Read, Excellency, read! Akbar read the words aloud. There are forty-eight caves, and in each cave a hundred piles. Akbar wiped the sweat from his forehead and paused. Samir, forgetting himself, shook the old man's shoulder. Read, read! Yes, I'm reading. The next words say that each pile contains a luck, a hundred thousand gold mohurs, or the equivalent of ingots. Excellency, what is that worth? Wait a minute. Suddenly fearful, Sirdar Akbar covered the tablet with some papers and tiptoed to the door. There was nobody outside, 
Yildirim and his friends could be heard singing at the top of their voices. Akbar went back to his desk. The inscription continues, Each pile has 1,000 bags of 100 coins or equivalent gold. Total amount, 48 crore. 48 crore? Excellency, a crore is half a million! Samir's eyes rolled. A crore, Samir, Akbar said quietly, is indeed half a million according to the Dari Persian reckoning. But this writing was done by a Mughal, Indian, scribe or treasurer. In India, a crore is exactly ten million. There are 480 million coins, or their equivalent, in those caves. At first, Akbar had thought that he could do something with the gold, put himself and his daughter out of the hands of the communists, perhaps. Or, crazy idea, give it to the Kabul regime of Babrak Kamal so they could buy the country's freedom from the Russians. He and Samir sat in the room, at first elated, then dazed, finally discussing eagerly about what gold, on such a scale, could do. It was Samir who brought them both back to reality. There is a saying, Excellency, he said, that if a cat is rich, the money belongs to its master. We can't use the gold. The moment we tell Engineer Yildirim or Kabul or the Russians we are dead men, and then someone else owns it. The only hope is to get it out of the country so that it can be sold abroad. Then the money could be used to buy arms for the people. If the people don't get guns and rockets soon, they will all be wiped out, now that the Russians are destroying the farms and villages and slaughtering the population. Someone abroad. That was it. The Americans? The British? Akbar's mind began to work. If he had someone to send, he might try anywhere. Japan, Western Europe. He could get the gold to the sea, all right. He had blood links with a huge Durrani clan, whose territory extended from Kandahar to the ocean, to the shores of the Arabian Sea. But Akbar had nobody to send. After all, Samir was more of a houseboy than a diplomat. Emissaries in modern times had to negotiate through institutions, ministries, and established delegations. Samir, the servant, would never get an appointment with a high government official anywhere. In ancient times, of course, one simply sent one's messenger with a token or password to a single person, a ruler or a prince, who would have the power to say yes or no. Akbar flicked on the radio a cheap, medium-wave transistor which he had got, though forbidden to own a set, from one of the guards. He had paid for it with his wristwatch, the gold Vacheron Constantine. Radio Pakistan came through loud and clear on the medium-wave, the nearest station which gave anything resembling impartial news. It was time for the news, in English. Akbar had once laughed, as so many others did, at the lilting accent which people who had been educated in Britain called Bombay Welsh. Not any more. Now it was his only channel to the real world. Nothing about Afghanistan, except that there were now three million refugee Afghans driven out by napalm, phosphorus bombs and terror sheltering in Pakistan. Perhaps a quarter of the entire population. Then, His Royal Highness, Prince Jamal ibn Zayed al-Narabi, son and heir of His Majesty King Zayed al-Narabi, monarch of Narabia, the North Arabian Kingdom, will visit Pakistan in six weeks' time, heading a mission to inspect some of the 280 Afghan refugee camps in the northwest frontier region. His Royal Highness has especially asked that the mission be regarded as a private one, and in deference to his wishes, there will be no state welcome. He is expected to arrive in Peshawar on June the 12th and will be accompanied by only a small personal staff, though these will be individuals of high rank. The governor of the Northwest Frontier Province has intimated that it would be regarded as a seemly gesture if, in their private capacities, 
The people of the region were in evidence in the streets on the day of his arrival, perhaps with Nurabian flags, to express brotherly greetings to the representative of our fellow Islamic country. After the news, there will be a talk entitled Nurabia Today and Yesterday. Akbar jumped up, ignoring the twinge of rheumatism which sudden action always produced in his leg. Samir Jan, we've got it. That's the answer. I see it all now. Excellency? Didn't you hear? I don't understand all that English. Frankish tongues sound like zzzz, nothing more to me. An Arab prince is visiting Pakistan soon, Samir. He will be in Peshawar city, no distance from here, just over the border. Excellency? He is the son of King Zaid. May his good fortune continue. You were there with me for three years, Samir, while I was ambassador at his court. His majesty knows me well. He has oil money, billions of dollars. I remember, Excellency. I can still speak Arabic. Samir still did not understand what his master was driving at. Like a good servant, he waited. He'll buy the gold from us and bank the money in Switzerland. Then we can contact the freedom fighters who are being slaughtered for lack of guns. They could buy rockets everything. Our country might yet be saved, Samir. Samir nodded slowly. May I be your sacrifice, Excellency? You know better, of course, but you can't go to the prince. You're under close supervision, arrest, in fact. And how could we transport the gold from here to Pakistan? Transport is easy, Samir. We are in the country of the Durrani clan, and it stretches from here through Pakistan to the Arabia Sea. They have been smuggling from there to the Gulf in Dows for centuries. They'll do it. Akbar's eyes were gleaming, and he tugged at his neat goatee excitedly. As to who will go to the Prince Samir, there is only one person who would do it, and do it at whatever cost. Someone who has seen the gold and knows Narabia. That person is you, Samir. With that optimism which, over the centuries, has unseated as many Afghans as it has supported, Samir immediately said, Yes, I could do that, Excellency, but I do not remember the prince. That's not important. He was studying at Oxford when we were at Hadika City, but you can prove that you have been there if you talk to him, and you can show him samples of the gold. Then he is bound to take the message to King Zaid. Samir considered it. Mumkin, it's possible. The old man smiled and touched Samir on the shoulder. Good. I'm tired now, Samir. Let's leave it at that for today. In the morning, again getting permission from Yildirim by offering Salik as a hostage, the two men went back to the cave. At the entrance, the old man slipped off his sandals and went down into the shaft. There was no sign that anyone else had been there. Piles of dust which he had left, craftily positioned the last time, were intact. The pair of them did not stay long, only long enough to collect, in the haversack which he carried on inspections, a hundred or so of the gleaming mohurs. It was on this visit that Akbar noticed that there were smaller passages and air vents in the treasure cave. He would be able to use those, he thought, to bring cables, to install lighting in the warren of passages. That would be useful in the shifting of the horde. He had already worked out that the treasure, estimated roughly by the number of almost perished sacks piled up in the tunnels, had a present-day value of something like $400 billion. It didn't look like it. Gold weighs heavy, but takes up remarkably little space. It was a sum equal to the entire monetary reserves of the oil countries, more gold than any single country on earth possessed, nearly three times the entire external assets of Saudi Arabia. It would not do to send Samir yet. They would first have to work out some scheme for getting the treasure out. Transport to the coast would be easier, 
Durrani trucks, then smugglers doused to the gulf. All that day Akbar surveyed the site. Yes, he thought, that was it. It would be quite possible to remove the coins through the hills via the ruined mosque, since, although it commanded a view of much of the countryside below, it nestled among features which sheltered the route from observation. This must have been in the mind of whoever hid the gold, or whoever built the mosque. A treasury with a way to get in and out without being seen. Then Yildirim announced that an inspection team, Afghan and Russian, was visiting the site for evaluation in three weeks' time. This was both good and bad, Akbar realized. It meant that engineer Yildirim would start frenzied activity, having the place cleaned and painted, working out wall charts of progress, and generally demonstrating his value. It also meant that Akbar would be left more to himself and could get on with the wiring of the lights in the treasure tunnels. But it meant, too, that he could not yet risk sending Samir to Pakistan. His disappearance might make the Russians decide to strengthen the guards or arrest Samir's brother, any number of possibilities. Akbar was prepared to meet problems as they arose if he had only Yildirim to deal with, but not if he was faced by the tougher, ultra-suspicious socialist rescuers from the north. Going to and fro, being in and out of the treasure caverns so often may have made Akbar and Samir careless. Just after the Russians had made their inspection and left, the old man and his servant climbed to the ruined mosque for a final check, without maintaining their usual vigilance. When they came out of the mosque and sat in the shade of the wall, resting after their climb, they saw the spy. He walked past without seeing them at a slightly lower level, and then paused. He had found Akbar's sandals pointing to the entrance to the steps. They recognized him, a police agent from Kabul ostensibly concerned with security, but probably posted here to keep an eye on Yildirim. As they watched, he went down the steps leading to the treasure cave. You let him get out of here alive, said Akbar, his aging face as hard and desperate as anything Samir had ever seen. And our country is finished. Afghanistan is dead. The army and the KGB will destroy us as they destroyed the rest of Central Asia. Excellency, I promise, by my head and eyes, he is a dead man. The lithe six-foot figure of Samir slipped away like a wraith. Former Minister Akbar made a little gesture of despair and turned away, shoulders hunched. He sat down and lay back in the shade. Everything depended on Samir. Samir's body tensed with total concentration as he tiptoed along the tunnel towards where the spy was now standing, flashlight in hand, absorbing the incredible truth. Suddenly there was a click and the shaft was flooded with light, bright as high noon. The spy had found the switch operating the lights which Akbar had so laboriously installed. The two saw each other at the same moment. Samir sensed rather than saw the browning in the spy's hand. There was a slight bend in the passage which would intrude on the gunman's line of sight, so Samir threw himself against the wall. Then he started forward as the first shots rang out, ricocheting off the hard rock of the tunnel. The firing stopped. The man would shoot again, Samir knew, but perhaps later rather than sooner. He would have deduced by now that Samir did not have a gun, and would probably wait until a minimum distance separated them. Only a few yards to go now. Something hit his toe and he reached down. It was the spy's flashlight, which he had dropped when he reached for his gun. Samir picked it up and threw it as part of the same movement straight at his adversary's head. It missed by an inch and crashed in pieces against the wall. The place was full of cordite fumes and the spy's face emerged from the smoke, grinning evilly. Samir dived to the man's ankles. As he launched himself forward and down, he was aware of the spy's confident crouch, aiming the gun at him as calmly as a man with an aerosol of insecticide about to destroy a blue bottle. Oh God, it shouldn't be like this. 
Again a shot, and in the same moment a thump on his shoulder, like a giant's punch. The sick, sick feeling as he doubled up. Then a great gasp, a reflex, as if his body screamed to heal itself with air. Samir lay still. He heard groaning and realized the sound came from himself. He looked up and saw his adversary's face wet with sweat but gleaming with triumph. The man was pushing another cartridge clip into the gun butt. Samir felt death seconds away. So this was how it happened. It was not at all like in the films. In a second or two now, he knew the spy would bend down, hold the automatic pistol close to his ear, and fire a single shot. Something buzzed at the back of Samir's head and became a man's voice, the voice of his village preacher, the ancient sage and mullah, Mullah Jan. Ya Hafiz, Ya Hafiz, O protector, O protector, it said. The mullah had taught him to say that when he was afraid. And he was afraid, too afraid to ask for mercy, too afraid to think. Now the spy was ready to deliver the coup de grace. There was his face, there was his breath. The gun barrel would be coming down right this moment, unless... Suddenly Samir felt as if he was watching the scene with himself in it from a distance. Something extra was working in his brain at a speed the rest of his mind could not register. He'd fallen sideways against the wall, jammed against it like a twisted tree trunk. His right shoulder was throbbing and his shirt was soaked with blood. His left side was pressed to the wall, the arm bent, the elbow in a depression, one of the niches which, centuries ago, someone had hewn out to hold a lamp. His fingers were moving now, feeling, clutching. They closed over something round, hard and sharp. It was the beaked part of a Greek or Roman baked clay lamp. As the spy bent down, quite slowly as though savouring the moment, Samir, using his left shoulder as a lever, his elbow as a fulcrum, the beaked lamp in his hand as a dagger, swung around and jerked himself upward. Gasping with pain, he struck straight at one of those infernal eyes. After that, it took only a few seconds. The spy was blinded and in no condition to fight a man of Samir's build, even with a bullet in his shoulder. My turn, comrade Kabul swine, said Samir. He picked up the spy's gun and shot him cleanly through the back of the neck. Samir's shoulder wound was bad, but not really dangerous, Akbar decided when Samir stumbled into daylight. But he would now have to get away immediately, Akbar realized, before anyone got to know about his injuries and linked it with the disappearance of the spy. In considerable pain, Samir set off within the hour, on foot, his wound covered in cotton waste and bound by a thick turban length of cloth. A few miles out of Kajakai he stopped in a village. There the blacksmith, accustomed to such problems and asking no questions, dug out the bullet and cauterized the wound with a piece of red-hot iron. His surgical instruments were a knife and a pair of pincers. Yildirim, as it happened, chose to visit Sirdar Akbar a few minutes after he had cleaned the blood of Samir's wound from his office floor. He looked up at the sound of the thunderous knock and wondered, as the communist engineer lurched into the room, whether Samir had been caught. In spite of his anxiety, the old man could not help feeling a rush of anger at the sight of this drunken fool, his chief engineer, who knew nothing about anything, but held authority because he was a good party man. The former garage hand, with a bottle of vodka in his right hand, stumbled across to an armchair and slumped into it, fixing the old man with his bloodshot eyes. Ex-ambassador, former prince and general scum, Ka Kusi Pada Lanat. The obscene oaths died away into a mumble. He closed his eyes and broke wind noisily. Yes, thought Sharifi, this is it. Had he found the gold or the dead man or both? 
He reached into his pocket and took out a pinch of snuff. He gave a thunderous sneeze which brought Yildirim back to life. I'm lonely, you old fool. It's wrong for people to drink alone. Here, have a shot. He offered the bottle, but Sharifi shook his head. All the more for me, then, Yildirim hiccuped and looked at him morosely. Come on, I only want to talk. Yildirim was looking at Sharifi anxiously, his mood changing under the influence of the drink. Tell me something about your life. Yes, that's what I want to hear. We might become friends. Who knows? So, thought Sharifi, he doesn't know anything about the gold or the spy yet. I might as well keep him occupied while Samir gets away. If I go on talking, perhaps he'll drink himself into a stupor. He blew his nose on a huge red bandana handkerchief. All right, Yildirim, I'll tell you what I was thinking about. Yildirim nodded, grinning, and settled deeper into the easy chair. As you know, there is always a holy fool who lives in the sacred place near here called the Chihilzina, the Forty Steps. When one dies, another always appears to take his place. And I feel that it is nearly time to spend the rest of my life in contemplation. Yildirim made for the door. Well, whatever you do, install the turbines first. I'm off to bed. This damn vodka isn't what it used to be. Upsets my head and stomach. Samir is gone? Yildirim was sprawled on the couch of his luxurious studio apartment when Akbar made his report. His head was throbbing from the excesses of the night before. Why should I care, engineer? I don't know how people can have feudal things like servants in a socialist country. Comrade Carmel will ban such exploitation as soon as he gets round to it. Let him go. People's servants are always running away. He's probably got into some trouble with the local villagers. But shouldn't we report it? To whom and for what? The revolution has far more important things to concern itself with than looking after former aristocrats' lackeys. Tell you what, though. What? Since I can't hold one or the other of the servants as a precaution against your desertion, from now on you'll have to take a guard with you when you go out. Certainly, Chief Engineer. I only wanted to make sure that you had the report that all was in order. Thank God. No police interest in Samir, so he would have a good chance of getting through, although he still wouldn't know whether they were after him or not. Quite a lot had happened since they had found the tunnel. Akbar had worked out that Amir Abdur Rahman's miners had missed the hoard by inches, and that it had only been revealed when a part of the inner wall, weakened by their burrowing, had fallen down. Akbar had installed electric light and had even found a tunnel which passed close to his own office. Samir had made a secret entrance to it so that it could be reached without going outside and making the long climb up the hill to the old mosque and then down the steps to the treasure cave. Akbar had coached Samir well in what he had to say to the prince, if he ever reached him, in Pakistan. It would need an experienced diplomat, with credentials and long-term planning, to deal with any modern chief of state. But to send a man to a traditional absolute monarch, or the son of one, people whom one knew on equal terms, and under such medieval circumstances as those prevailing in Afghanistan and Arabia, that was easy. And Samir was exactly the kind of man to do it, the faithful retainer a type recognisable anywhere in the Middle East. It could not happen in the West nowadays. Akbar smiled as he thought of it. But this was not the West. In spite of his throbbing shoulder, Samir made excellent time on the 60 kilometres of road from Kandahar to Kali Jadid on the Pakistan border. Plenty of trucks, driven by wild Pashtun tribesmen, ferried everything from machinery to tobacco along that route. The all-weather highway built by the Russians stopped there. 
northwards it ran nearly to the Soviet frontier, was suitable for the heaviest motor vehicles, including tanks. Even 30 years ago, the neighborly Soviet road builders knew what they were doing and why. Samir slipped across the unmarked border into Baluchistan and took the road for Keta. From there, he had no difficulty in getting a ride in a truck all the way up to Peshawar. There was no problem either in finding the Afghan camps. Three million refugees took up a lot of space. Samir soon found a small room in Peshawar and settled down to await the coming of the prince. Peshawar was more than a Pashtun city of 25,000 houses, more than a frontier town, more than a place near which millions of Afghan refugees, accustomed to the cool mountains, sweltered in desert camps. Even when the British had ruled India and severed this area from Afghanistan, the town had been a listening post for Russian spies. Now more than ever, it was a centre of Soviet intelligence. And here, before Prince Jamal's visit, Samir was to meet one of the Kremlin's most dangerous agents, and, innocently, to regard him as a friend. Peshawar city was teeming with refugees, expatriates, sympathisers of the rebel cause, Samir felt safe there, among his own. He was, however, very much alone, unable to confide in anyone. And he had weeks to wait until Jamal's coming. It would be necessary to sell some of his gold coins to pay his way. Thus it was that after a week of walking through the bazaars and finding himself down to his last few rupees, Samir approached a goldsmith with two of his mohurs two-thirds of an ounce of fine gold. The man tested it with acid, weighed it, and offered the Afghan the gold price of $2,000. Obviously one should not accept the first bid, Samir thought. He would see what others might give. Apart from some derisory offers of a few rupees, made by people deceived through greed into hoping that this untidy figure might be completely stupid, the price seemed fairly standard. There was one exception. A man in an antique shop took one look at the coins, then two looks at Samir, and placed 60,000 rupees, worth $3,000, on his counter. Samir accepted at once and, innocently, became quite attracted to the genial antiquary, with whom he soon found much in common. To be fair to engineer Akbar's servant, the goldsmith, Rind by name, was a highly skilled operative. Anyone who had two gold mohurs of the Delhi minting of 1677, he guessed, might well have more of them. Anyone in Peshawar, like almost everyone in the rest of the subcontinent, dreamt of finding treasure, and not without reason, hordes were always turning up. Rind was not only a Soviet agent, he made a great deal of money buying antiques from the ignorant. The strategy with gold coins was practiced and effective. If someone found coins, he would take them from one goldsmith to another to have their value assessed. Then he would return to the highest bidder and sell at least some of them, probably not too many, to avoid suspicion. Rin's practice was to make sure that he offered the highest price to ensure the man's return. When he came back, he could be tracked to his home. More often than not, the gold was there, buried in the earth floor. A knife in the night, and the gold was rins for nothing. The system had produced many successes and no unfortunate consequences. People who found buried treasure almost always did two things. They moved it to their own houses, and they kept their mouths shut. For the police, therefore, the murder would always appear to be some kind of revenge killing, and the file would be closed for lack of information. Rind, who had developed almost a sixth sense for a really good haul, today invited his customer to the Café of the Green Roof for tea and talk. Although wary, Rind thought, Samir was undoubtedly lonely, 
and loneliness was the mark of a man with a secret in a town where it was never difficult to make friends, and very easy indeed if you had money to spend. Samir, though, was careful. The various men sent by Rind to follow him home reported after three of his visits that he had given them the slip in the maze of alleyways of the old town. Samir had not yet offered Rind any more gold, but he was clearly a man with something on his mind, so the spy decided to cultivate him. Samir was quite flattered by the attentions of his affluent friend and by his suggestion that they might work together, dealing in antiques. Rind was not impressed by a couple of mohurs, and besides, he had shown himself to be a fervent anti-communist. They had many things in common. Samir had spent three years in Arabia with Serdar Akbar, and Rind spoke Arabic too. He had learnt it in Moscow, but he did not mention that to Samir. He spoke with a Gulf accent, which was an added bond. Rind was biding his time, certain that Samir would invite him to his place of residence one day soon, when the Afghan suddenly forestalled him. It was their mutual knowledge of Arabic which had given him the idea, and the words, prompted by the burden of his responsibility, came tumbling out. Mr. Rind, you might care to help me with something I am working on. I am afraid that I might fall ill or have difficulty in carrying it out. It would be wise to have a friend, so important is this matter. My dear friend, the spy showed his delight with a great smile which Samir took for friendliness. I will help you in any way you wish, Basa or Kashim, on my head and eyes. Whether it was from fear of illness or the narcotic charas, hemp resin, which the red agent had put in his water pipe, Samir told the whole story to his new friend and signed his own death warrant. The following day Samir was dead, stabbed through the heart in Rin's garage, his body buried in a disused graveyard. Before he got rid of Samir, Rind had a complete picture of the situation. He knew all about the find of the treasure and about the target, Prince Jamal. It would be easy to impersonate Samir in the negotiations with the Arab. He even knew about the Swiss bank arrangement, and a letter from Akbar on Samir's body gave the code word, Golden Bird, with which money would be accepted or given out by the bank without any questions. Any guerrilla organization, or KGB man, could draw, when the deal was struck, up to four billion dollars. Rind would report to Moscow Center. They would, he was sure, allow the treasure to go to Arabia, since King Zaid would be buying it with his own and other oil states' funds. The USSR would then be heir to the accumulated riches of the Gulf, without having to fire a shot, suborn a leader, or even organize a political party. It was testimony to the power of Soviet secret police training that Rind dismissed almost instantly the temptation to usurp the whole four billion and make it his own. The Russians, as they always boasted, looked after their own, and Rin's chief, the man in Moscow whom they called the Snail, would reward him well. After all, it was the coup of the century, perhaps the greatest coup of all time. Besides, he reflected, the KGB left no operative in doubt as to what happened to traitors. That same night, the message, a report in detail and his own suggestions for action, went out through the automatic encoder of Rin's special radio hidden in the dusty antique shop in Peshawar. The radio's dish antenna was directed towards the geostationary satellite of the Soviet Intersputnik network 22,000 miles above. This relayed West Asian KGB reports to Moscow, transmitting in ultra-short bursts, and operating on randomly changing frequencies. The high-security transmission equipment was a triumph of electronics engineering, next to impossible to locate. The transmissions were so short that nobody would pick them up, the Russians were sure of that. After all, their new Molny lightning system 
was an adaptation of the Motorola rig made for the CIA in Scottsdale, Arizona, acquired by the KGB from American infiltration agents captured in Eastern Bloc territory.